Well, hello again. We're back to discuss uh, some doctrines, fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith that I think we need to understand because of the tempest, the storm that is not only coming, it's already on us. And you are going to be challenged as to what you believe and why you believe it. I would like to say that there are many Christians that don't exactly know what they believe. They say, well, I believe in Jesus. And, uh, and that's good. And that works. Believe me, it really does. I remember in my, in my uh, early Christian days, I was placed by my family in a uh, contest against an Episcopal priest who had spent years, uh, he had divinity degrees and all that stuff, and I was just a young kid that just got saved, and his mission was to teach me that the Bible was not true, and to show to me all the discrepancies and genealogies and linguistical uh, parsings of verbs that he had learned in seminary to try to dissuade me from the Christian faith, and all I can tell you is all the alarms went off. I didn't actually know what to say, but I knew in whom I had believed. <laughs> and that was, <clears throat> that was a good thing at that time. So today we're going to talk about some fundamental doctrines. We're going to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We've already covered his uh, birth and conception, how that he is not only the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man and what that means. But I want to discuss the death of Christ from a uh, teleological Viewpoint. A teleological viewpoint simply means looking far into the distance, getting an understanding of the mission and reason and purpose. Uh, the death of Christ was very unique. All right, nobody ever died like Jesus died, and I don't just mean like stopping breathing or having a ruptured pericardium or whatever. Um, his death was very different than any other person on earth. Now, there are those that try to put the blame for the death of Christ on other people. The Roman church blamed the Jews for many years during the time of the Spanish Inquisition that was used um, as one of the things to justify why they were killing Jews. I think they did about 10 times what Hitler did in the Inquisition. And the Bible verse that they used to simply justify them was that it's recorded in the scripture that when the... Uh, when Pilate tried to release Christ because he realized Pilate knew that there wasn't um, any real offense that, that, that Christ had done. He had been tried by the Jews or convicted of the Jews for blasphemy, but Roman law didn't have that. And so the Jews very craftily, they transmigrated or transferred uh, the sentence from um, blasphemy over to treason. And so amongst themselves, Jesus was a blasphemer because he said he was the son of God and that was blasphemy and he was worthy of death. But however, when they brought him to Pilate and blasphemy wouldn't fly because Roman law let people say whatever they wanted to say, um, they weren't allowed to talk against Caesar. This was treason. So they said, well, uh, he claims to be a king and we have no king but Caesar. So Pilate was kind of like, oh gosh, what am I going to do now? And he was actually looking for a way to release Jesus Christ. Christ. And they said, no, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Pilate said, this man hasn't done anything. And he washed his hands, went through the ceremonial symbolism and whatever. And the Jew simply said, let his blood be upon us. Okay, but you crucify him. We want him crucified. And uh, that was the, that was uh, the lemma that the Roman church had used during the Spanish Inquisition because of the Bible record of the Jews saying, let his blood be upon us. Uh, when they were speaking to Pilate. Now, Jesus himself knew about his death. He prophesied about it. He told his disciples several times. They didn't quite understand it. Uh, and he said that, that, that the Son of Man, he was going to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles who would put him to death. Now, this does not mean that the Gentiles were responsible for his death either. The Romans didn't kill Christ any more than the Jews did. The truth is, is that it was God's will and pleasure for Christ to die. And this may sound like, whoa, what do you mean? God wanted him to die? Yes, this was the plan. This was in line with the fulfilling of his mission on earth. The Father and the Son had mutually agreed uh, that when the fullness of time was, was come, God would send forth his Son in the likeness of human flesh made of a woman. And so Jesus came um, at the right time. He came under the right conditions. Uh, the political system was right for him to come. Even the race that he came to, these were merely um, preparations 
made to facilitate and bring about his death, actually. Jesus knew that he was going to die. And in fact, Jesus not only arranged his own death, uh, he made it very clear that no man takes his life from me. He said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own of my own, of my own choice, of my own will. This commandment have I received of the Father. So it was actually Christ himself who chose to suffer under Pontius Pilate and to be crucified uh, by Rome as an, well, as as an insurgent um, of the Jewish people who were occupied and dominated by the foreign power Rome. Okay, so <clears throat> he came at the right time. Had he come at a different time, things may have turned out differently, but God being omniscient, God being able to transverse all time, um, as, as a matter of fact, God in omnipresence is present with all of his being in any point in space and time. <clears throat> um, that gives God quite an advantage as far as when Christ was born. And so this was nothing new. Um, Isaiah, oh, I don't know, 650, 1,000, before, uh, way before Jesus was born, um, he said, surely he has borne our sorrows, he's carried our griefs, and uh, we did esteem him stricken. He, he was smitten of God and afflicted. Isaiah saw this. But he said he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And then he continued to say uh, it needed to be his stripes and his back and his, him, him who brought the healing because he continues and says that all we like sheep, we've gone astray and we've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him, speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. And he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You remember in the judgment, there was time when Jesus until he was adjured to speak by the Most High God, he didn't say anything at all to the priest. He, he didn't answer. And even when he went to Pilate, Pilate was amazed that he's like a lamb brought before a slaughter. Um, he's not opening his mouth as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So opened he not his mouth. He was taken from prison. He was taken from judgment. And uh, Isaiah said, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of living. That means at 33 years old, that's a, that's a young time to die. But why? For the transgression of my people was he stricken, the prophet said, or God speaking through the prophet. He made his grave with the wicked and uh, with the rich in his death. You remember he was crucified between... Um, malefactors or thieves. And uh, as far as his burial, uh, he was buried with the rich. And Romans didn't bury people who were crucified. <clears throat> they simply threw him in the garbage. I mean, literally, the body of Christ was destined to be thrown off into uh, in the Valley of Hinnom, there's a place called Gehenna, which is actually a dump, and it's full of worms and fire. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And if, if you read the scripture, Jesus talks about this, you know, place and he likens it unto hell. This is a really bad place. Well, the bodies of the people who were crucified were not given the dignity of a burial. They were simply thrown on the garbage dump. They were pitched out and the worms got them and what the worms didn't eat, the fire consumed and they just sat and they rotted there. But Jesus was different. He made his uh, grave with the rich. There was a man named Joseph of Arimathea who had a tomb that was hewn out for his family. And um, uh, this is where the body of Jesus was laid. Why? And the prophet says, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And this is interesting. Then he says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He's speaking of God. It was God's will to bruise his son. Uh, he hath put him to grief. Who put him to grief? God put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Okay, we know from the New Testament, he that knew no sin became sin that we may become the righteousness of God in him. And a lot of people think that sin is just um, organically original in the flesh. Original sin is an organic substance in the flesh. I want you to know that God made the soul, the immaterial part of Christ. Um, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. This was, this was uh, a horrid oblation. I mean, this was, this was incredible. Uh, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord um, 
shall prosper in his hand. That means literally that it was God's pleasure that he was smitten, he was flogged, he was spit upon, he was mocked, he was crucified, he was he was nailed, um, he was he, he, his and. And that's just the physical. What was happening on the inside of Christ, I'm sure, was uh, um, exponentially greater than what we could see on the outside. And uh, Isaiah says that uh, he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. In other words, the price that Christ paid was acceptable to God. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide with him a portion with the great. Um, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors, Isaiah said. So this is, and that's Isaiah 53, by the way. Uh, we understand this is a perfect picture of the death of Jesus Christ foretold in Scripture. As Paul said in Corinthians, we know that Christ died for us. How? According to folklore, according to the way we think it should be, according to what other people figured out? No, he died according to the Scriptures, okay? So we understand from the Scripture that Christ died for our sins. And, um, but the question remains, why is death? necessary, okay? Uh, why should an innocent person like Jesus, who is made of the flesh, born of a woman, made of flesh, tempted in all points, like as we yet without sin, why should a person who is innocent pay the penalty for a person who is guilty? I mean, that seems like an injustice in itself. Well, to understand this, we're going to need to know something about the personality of God, about the character of God, who God is. Now, all of the attributes or the, I don't know how to say attributes, all of the uh, qualities, okay? I may, there, there may be a better word than that, but all the qualities that God possesses in his personality, he does have a personality. We're made in his image. We have personalities. God is somebody Okay, he is not a nobody. He is not an everybody. God has a personality, which we know from Scripture. And, uh, but all these qualities or attributes God possesses in an absolute form. That means there's no limit to it. If God wants to love, it's limitless. If God wants to hate, pff, watch out. If God wants to have mercy, it's limitless. If God, he, he knows all of these attributes in extreme in in a form without any limit to them at all. Now, as human beings, we're made in his image, and we can know something about love and mercy and jealousy and anger, but we only know them in the capacity, in a very limited capacity. We don't hold any of these attributes in, in the absolute form, even though we're made in his image, okay? Uh, but we know something of them from our own personalities, our own our own, um, I guess, composition, you could say. Now, one of the attributes of God is justice. And justice is extremely significant in the death of Christ because there are people and there have been doctrines down through the ages that say, no, the atonement wasn't necessary. God could simply have, as Peter said, winked at sin or forgotten. It doesn't mean he winked at it. It doesn't mean that sin is irrelevant. It doesn't mean that sin means nothing. Sin is incredibly tangible. Let me tell you that every heartache, every tear, every funeral service, every, every problem, every soldier killed at war, every murder on the streets, every rape, every injustice, every, every lie, every marriage that is broken, any sexual, every sexual abuse, everything that has ever happened came into the world through one man, Adam. He sinned. And because of Adam's sin, everything that has gone haywire today, a lot of people blame God. It's a very common question. If God is so good, then why doesn't he do this? It's, it, it's not God's prerogative. It was Adam's choice. We are the descendants of Adam. If you want to start throwing blame around and start throwing mud, why don't you throw it at Adam? Okay, by one man, sin entered into the world. Don't throw it at God. God is, Jesus is the one man by him that sin was taken out of the world. Okay, so God didn't bring it in. God took it out. So all these things we blame God for, um, that's just a lie. You're believing a lie. It's not God who does it. It's because the human race has fallen. Thank you, Adam, very much. 
Okay, but justice is not an ideology that God invokes or an idea that he has and says, well, I think I'll do this. God doesn't God doesn't have anything like that. God doesn't do anything that he got the idea from somewhere else. God is just because it's part of his essence, his heart, his personality. That's who he is. Essence is not separate from his action. And um, as a matter of fact, actions are not separate from essence either. You are what you do. I think it's uh, Proverbs, the eighth chapter says, even a child is known by his doings. You say, oh, well, that man steals. Well, he's not really a thief, even though he steals. And we come up with a number of reasons why he's not a thief. If you lie, you're a liar. If you're, if you steal, you're a thief. I mean, you are what you are. You're, you're not, you know, you're not, your essence cannot be separated from your actions. You are what you do, basically. Now, Fortunately for us who were Christians, God has made a way through repentance and the power of his Holy Spirit uh, th that causes this born again person inside of us to conform to the image of Christ every day. In other words, we can get forgiveness if, if, if is the hugest word you'll ever hear, if we repent. And let me tell you something about true repentance, all right? If you do something, if, if you do something horrible and say, I'll never do that again because that hurt me, that's just regret because you're thinking about yourself. Or if you hurt somebody else, I'll never do that again because that hurt my brother or my, my mother, my father, my sister, my schoolmate, something like that. I feel really bad about that. That's remorse. Uh, but when you say, I'm sorry and what I did, I did against God, that's repentance. That's what the difference is between remorse and regret. Repentance is towards God. Repentance is from dead works towards God. And the dead works is an issue in itself. Those are the things that we did for our own selves, but we were actually doing them as an offense against God. They were offenses against God. Even Paul, who was very, uh, by worldly standards, successful in what he did, he repented of it. He said, I'm sorry. Well, he didn't personally regret that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel and learned what he learned and knew about the law like he learned, but he did say, compared to the knowledge of Christ, it's dumb. It was worthless. It had no, um, it had no intrinsic, intrinsic, key, all right, key word, intrinsic value. So, um, so we become more like Christ every day because the Spirit of God grants us repentance and gives us the ability to repent. I want you to know that there is... Uh, uh, there is righteousness that comes in two ways. Two. Count them. Two. All right? Righteousness can be imparted, which simply means God says, the righteousness of Christ, bam, is yours. You got it. It's yours, baby. Take it. Uh, and righteousness can be imputed, which, uh, the, what, excuse me, I got those backwards. Imputed righteousness is when God just makes a declaration. Imparted righteousness uh, is when it, it, it becomes a part of your soul, your person, your being, your essence. You become, um, you start to live right, that's all. And so there's a righteousness that is imputed and there's a righteousness that is imparted, okay? Now, God's justice comes from his nature, Okay, he is just just. Now, the um, original definition of the word justice, it means um, the exercise of authority and vindication uh, of right by assigning reward or punishment. And that comes from about the 12th century or the middle of the 12th century somewhere as we go back. Because the world, world and philosophers and politicians have their own they have their own definitions about what justice actually is, okay? Um, the philosophers and politicians of this world, they have redefined justice in many different ways. Um, it was Plato. Plato defined it um, as saying that it was giving a precise recompense um, for what one has received. And that wasn't so weird, except he came up with some really weird uh, thing about command justice, which means that we get it from God transcendentally. He didn't accept that, but his buddy Socrates believed that um, the only real justice came with knowledge and that um, he believed that philosophers should rule the world because they were the only ones that understood what is good, what is fair, and what is just. Kind of crazy, but uh, 
not nearly as crazy as some of the things that are out in the world today. The world talks of a uh, social justice, and they talk about a legal justice from several platforms, such as um, wealth and opportunity, okay? Well, wealth and opportunity are diametrically opposed. They're polar opposites. You cannot have equal wealth and equal opportunity. If you have equal wealth, then you must not permit equal opportunity. If you have equal opportunity, then you're not, then, then, then you cannot have equal well, somebody's going to have a different opportunity than somebody else. And from an egalitarian viewpoint, they're not going to be the same. There's various other platforms of redistribution, um, you, uh, utilitarian um, and welfare maximization. They're grouped into um, ethnic groups. Should we give it to, um, to minorities? Should we divide everything up and split it by nations? <clears throat> or how about Marxists? You can go individual, each according to his need, each according to his ability. And it also bleeds over into the legal or the uh, penal systems of rehabilitative. Some are deterrent, some are reparative. These are all different ideas that the world has about justice. But if justice is really to render to everyone that which is due to him, then you need to find a person capable of correctly discerning between truth and error for the purpose of rendering to everyone that which is due, okay? And this is an argument or an issue that's totally ignored by all, all the politicians who cry for equal this and equal that. Um, who's going to enforce it? Who's going to be in charge? Really, they assume that as the elite, they will be in charge. But Man does not have a very good history of being in charge, okay? Uh, read, read a history book. Read an old history book. Uh, don't read a new one. Read an old history book that lets you know that um, man is wicked. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked and, 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 uh, or desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination and the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Isaiah said his hands are defiled with blood, his, his lips speak lies. Uh, he lies in wait for his brother's blood. Uh, man has a very, and this is not just Bible talking. This is, look at history. Look at the wars that have been, um, at the genocides that have happened. Okay, oh, let me just cut to the quick. God is the only one who is the infallible judge, okay? God is the only competent person to be a judge. And uh, he can discern from truth and error. Some other people, they can discern maybe a black sock from a white sock, but they're definitely not infallible. God is infallible. God really knows who's playing and who's not. He knows the truth about everything because he reads the hearts of men. So God is a just, a just judger, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So because God is just, guess what? He's the judge. He has to be the judge because if you understand situations that need judgment, uh, then judgment has to be executed. This is called wisdom, and that's another one of God's attributes. God is wise, and wisdom requires, doesn't suggest, it requires that judgment be executed. Now, when judgment is executed, when the sentence is pronounced and judgment is executed, this in turn allows another wonderful attribute. You may say, I don't think judgment and judgment are very wonderful, but it allows mercy to have value. Mercy has no value without judgment. So since God is just and God is judge and God is wise, he must therefore execute. And oddly enough, God is, <laughs> he is his own executioner. He, he, he doesn't leave it up to somebody else to say, well, you carry out that part of the law. Uh, God opened the earth and uh, swallowed Achan and the dissenters, okay? Anyway, it is historically evident that man is incapable of dealing with moral absolutes uh, due to his own depravity. That's one of the very fundamental things um, the depravity of the human race. People want to say, well, what is a cult? A cult is defined by five basic things. Number one, uh, they err from the Apostles' Creed in the person of God the Father. 
number two, in the person of God the Son, or, or in the person of God the Son, or number three, they err in the total depravity of man or the need for salvation. They don't recognize that man needs to be saved, and if mankind does not need to be saved, if you don't think you need to be saved, then you cannot be saved until you recognize your need to be saved. All right, and number four is the means of revelation. The only means of revelation, the vicar on earth, the interpreter, the anointing that we have received of him and abides in us. We need not that any man teach us, but the same anointing teaches us all things. I am referring to the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Godhead that represents and reveals the person of Jesus Christ, okay? And I can say even in this sense, and it's just a theological term, um, what we have from Christ, there is no further revelation. Jesus, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But there are many things that we don't have illumination on. So the Holy Spirit will illuminate. Uh, but as far as revelation, um, it ended with Jesus and he was the express image of the Godhead. The only revelation I see in scripture is, is that the Lord is going to be revealed from heaven with fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, of all the ungodly sinners. And that's a revelation to come. But anyway, did you ever remember, you, you, you read, I think it's in Luke where Jesus sat and he read, um, he read the scripture from the scroll of Isaiah that the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And uh, he read right up to the part um, uh, that it was time to announce the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll. And he said, this day, the scripture has been fulfilled in your ear. And he sat down. That's when they took him to the cliff and tried to throw him over because they really... Uh, didn't like what he was preaching. I tend to believe that they were more paranoid about the Romans taking their place uh, than, than someone just claiming to be the Messiah. But the uh, right where Jesus closed the scroll where he stopped reading, it wasn't a period. It wasn't even a semicolon. It's just a comma. The next phrase in that was, and the day of vengeance of our God. And, uh, but Jesus didn't read that because that hasn't come yet. Okay, if Jesus had read the next line, we'd all be dead. We'd all be history, dead meat, goners, you know. But he didn't. He closed right there because the first coming of Christ was not for the purpose of bringing uh, the day of vengeance of our God. There's going to be a horrendous day coming, but we'll get into that later as we move down into Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, and go through eternal judgment and things like that. So I can reiterate that uh, God is the only capable judge, and Christ was the only one who could die for our sins because he was the only one who could be crucified without just dying for his own sins. However, I want to get into another side of the story, which is a much more uh, compelling motivation for Christ, I believe, uh, not just sentimentalism, where that Christ saw how pitiful we were and felt sorry for us. And uh, this was called propitiation. And it means that he was not only going to pay for the offender to be reconciled to the offended, Okay, and if you want to put this in a courtroom scenario, he wasn't only going to um, represent the defendant uh, he, against the plaintiff or to reconcile the defendant, which is more accurate, to the plaintiff, but for the plaintiff to be recompensed or reimbursed for all the damages, all the expenses that were caused him. Okay, uh, we were the offenders. We are in court, we're the defendants. The plaintiff is God. He's saying, uh, I have incurred great damage. And Christ, <clears throat> as advocate, has come in and is mediator between God and man. Christ paid for the damage and the debt that had been done by us to the Father. This is called propitiation. And Christ did it not to satisfy you or me, but to satisfy the Father. Christ paid for our sins our offenses against God, our insults, our blasphemies, our slanderings, our dishonoring him, our disrespecting him. Um, every infraction of the law, Jesus nailed it to the cross. He paid our bills with his blood. 
for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Okay, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Redundant, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Christ drank the cup of sufferings from his father. Remember in the garden, he said, is there any way that this cup can pass? <clears throat> there isn't. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Christ drank the cup of sufferings, which the father had given him, um, exacting from his body, his flesh, his blood, his emotions, his, uh, his very soul was made an atonement. And that atonement was necessary because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. <clears throat> and Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it as white as snow.